Sauron. When we look at the Dark Lord, we often focus on his overwhelming power and the influence that he has. Yet it is equally important to examine his critical vulnerabilities, the ones that led to his downfall. So today I will dive into those inherent weaknesses that doomed Zaron's ambitions for dominion over Middle-earth. From his over-reliance of the One Ring to his underestimation of the Free People's resilience, I will attempt to unravel how these flaws played a pivotal role in his defeats both in the War of the Last Alliance and in the War of the Ring. So let's get into it. Dark Lord Sauron forged in secret a master ring to control all others. The last alliance of elves and men came together at the end of the Second Age of Middle-earth, as we often see in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and many others for that fact. Whatever external power or form of strength that empowers an individual will often be the thing itself that gets turned into their prison. If we look at Saruman as an example, Isengard was that thing that projected his power, yet at the end of it all, Isengard is what became his prison. The same can be said of Sauron. His greatest weakness was his reliance on the One Ring and on the reliability of an army fighting against his will. As we touched upon in our video called How Sauron Makes War, which please go check it out if you want to, a fighting force which is on the battlefield against their will by threat of danger is often no match for a highly motivated force which has something to fight for. And with the armies of Sauron all under the threat of his wrath, and his opponents fighting for the very future of their world, these two weaknesses would culminate in his defeat. As Alvon tells us in his council in The Lord of the Rings, I beheld the last combat on the slopes of Orodrin, where Gilgalad died, and Elendil fell, and Narsil broke beneath him. But Sauron himself was overthrown, and he sealed or cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword, and took it for his own. Alaron's recounting of the Battle of Dagolad serves not just as a historical narrative, but also as a stark illusion of Sauron's critical error in investing so much of his power in the One Ring. This quote highlights how Sauron's dependence on the ring, while initially a source of strength, ultimately became his undoing. It's a potent reminder of the danger of placing all one's power in a single external source. And into this ring, he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. It is also important to note that much of his strength and willpower went into that creation of the One Ring, which was to become a source of strength and immortality. But this had the effect of tying him to that same ring, keeping him bound to it even after Isildur cut it from his finger after the Battle of Dagolat. This was enough to throw down the Dark Lord Sauron, however, just in his physical form. Yet, the ring, to which Sauron's spirit was bound, allowed him to endure and seek to reclaim his rightful spot at the top of the power hierarchy of Middle-earth. The letters of J.R.R. Tolkien again prove wonderful insight into the people and purpose of Middle-earth, really helping us look at this question, with us this time looking at letter 131. But to achieve this he had been obliged to let a great part of his own inherent power, a frequent and very significant motive in myth and fairy story, pass into the One Ring. While he wore it, his power on Earth was actually enhanced, but even if he did not wear it, that power existed and was in rapport with himself. He was not diminished, unless some other seized it and became possessed of it. If that happened, the new possessor could, if sufficiently strong and heroic by nature, challenge Sauron, become master of all that he had learned or done since making of the One Ring, and so overthrow him and usurp his place. This was the essential weakness he had introduced into his situation in his effort, largely unsuccessful, to enslave the elves, and in his desire to establish a control over the minds and wills of his servants. There was another weakness. If the One Ring was actually unmade, annihilated, then its power would be dissolved. Sauron's own being would be diminished to vanishing point, and he would be reduced to a shadow, a mere memory of malicious will. This excerpt from Tolkien's letter explicitly details the paradox of the One Ring. It was both Sauron's greatest asset and his most significant vulnerability. 
by investing his power in the ring. Sauron became invincible as long as he possessed it, but he also exposed himself to catastrophic defeat should the ring be destroyed or used against him. This strategic blunder underscores a fundamental weakness in Sauron's character, an inability to foresee the consequences of his own actions, or really being blinded by his ambition for absolute control. This is similar to how Gandalf describes Sauron's presence to Frodo in the Shadow of the Past chapter, where he is said to have haunted the minds and the memories of the peoples of Middle-earth to an extent that even they were not aware. The first time we get some insight into the nature of the ring comes in that chapter, but this is nothing compared to how much we learn about its history at the Council of Alrond, where Lord Alrond first claims that those who came would learn of the enemy's purpose, telling those who had come there was nothing to do but resist with hope or without it. As he says, the ring is the peril of all the western world. Then, he says that how they respond is the choice they must make, or the doom they must deal. There is a section from the Council of Alrond where it is said how Sauron, when he was disguised as a benevolent figure, that he deceived the Alvin Smiths of Eregion during the Second Age. By exploiting their desire for knowledge, Sauron learned all of their skills and then went on to use that to craft his own one ring, the one to control them all. However, Celebrimbor became aware of Sauron's deceit, and so the three Alvin rings were hidden. This betrayal is what kicked off a devastating war, marking an incredibly important chapter in all of Middle-earth. This betrayal of the Alvin Smiths by Sauron, as recounted by Alrond, is indicative of another of Sauron's weaknesses, deceit and manipulation. While these tactics initially allowed him to forge the ring and gain power, they also sowed the seeds of distrust and opposition among his enemies. This act of betrayal demonstrates Sauron's tendency to undermine his long-term security for short-term gains, a theme that resonates throughout his downfall. He goes on to explain the important events of the Second Age which culminated in the War of the Last Alliance and the fundamental disappointment of that final battle, which had laid waste to so much of the world and of its inhabitants. Alrond spoke of the rise of Numenor and its eventual fall, leading to the establishment of the realms of Arnor and Gondor by Elendil and his sons, Isildur and Anarion. Sauron's assault of these realms led to the formation of the last alliance of elves and men. Alrond reminisced about the grandeur of their assembled forces, which reminded him of the past wars against evil, highlighting the cynical nature of such conflicts and that constant threat posed by Sauron. The same could then be said of the War of the Ring, which again highlights the damage done to someone by splitting themselves for purposes of power, control and dominion. To make the ring as a ring of power only to become so devoted to it, so obsessed that the world is again thrown into warfare and ruin because of this obsession. It is true that the difference between poison and medicine really is just the dose. Sauron, he was so naturally powerful, after all he was one of the Ainur, you know, those beings that watched over the earth, the ones beneath the Valar. And Sauron was an apprentice of Aule the Smith, and he would gain incredible abilities off that Valar. And these abilities would be the ones that became necessary for crafting those rings, which continues to give us pause when we consider those failed pupils of Aule, which is strange only in its recurrence, as Saruman was also one of his apprentices. I mean, if you'd actually like a video looking solely on this idea of Aule and his failed pupils, if you will, please let me know that down below with a comment of Aule's students. And of course, I'll get working on that for you. But anyway, all of this suggests that there is something in the idea of creation that is transgressive when done recklessly and without caution, which does reflect the age in which Professor Tolkien himself lived. He personally served in the Great War and lived through the perils of that world war where the breakthrough of science made weapons so dangerous as to imperil the future of the world. Even though Tolkien has long despaired of his work being read as allegory, that does not mean it lacks application. It reflects the world and worldview of the author, whether intentionally or otherwise, and the recurring pattern of a character's strength being turned into their weakness is just found again and again in those great depths of Tolkien's Legendarium. The ring is mine. Another couple of Sauron's greatest weaknesses were his lack of foresight, his lack of understanding, and a great arrogance. It is said his arrogance was so great that he couldn't even fathom the idea that anyone who might even oppose him would even then consider destroying the One Ring. 
It just never crossed his mind. Not just that someone would want to destroy the ring, that someone could try and get so close to destroying it, but that even the physical implications of carrying the ring wouldn't be too much for anyone at all anyway. There was just no way in his head that this could be done. The corrosive effects on the spirit would be too much for anyone to handle. He made it that way. That part of Sauron is tied to the ring is his ultimate weakness, but it is underscored by his great narcissism, which is what allowed him to conceive of and enact such plans as the schemes of the rings of power in the first place. They were made for the purpose of controlling those who would come to wear them, as we see with the Nazgul. We recently put out a video that details the terrifying reality of becoming a Ringwraith, so again if you'd like to see our video on that, please check it out on the channel. But to understand how enthralled they were to Sauron and his reliance on them, we have the following excerpts from the moment Frodo decides to claim the ring. He is immediately informed of the plan to destroy the ring and he panics, summoning the Nazgul to fly straight to Mount Doom to retrieve the ring. We have Sam as witness to that moment where all seems to go wrong, as Frodo stands on the precipice of destiny with the ring in his hand. And in that moment his will is finally subsumed, and he acts in a way Sam had never seen never believed. His voice is changed and clearer, and this terrifies Sam. I have come, he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came here to do. I will not do this deed, the ring is mine, and suddenly as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight. And far away, as Frodo put on the ring and claimed it for his own, even in Samath Nauer, the very heart of his realm, the power in Barad-dûr was shaken, and the tower trembled from its foundation to its proud and bitter crown. The Dark Lord was suddenly aware of him. And the magnitude of his own folly was revealed to him in a blinding flash, and all the devices of his enemies were at last laid bare. Then his wrath blazed in consuming flame, but his fear rose like a vast black smoke to choke him, for he knew his deadly peril and the thread upon which his doom now hung. At his summons, wheeling with a rending cry, in a last desperate race there flew, faster than the winds, the Nazgul, the Ringwraiths, and with a storm of wings they hurtled southwards to Mount Doom. The dramatic shift in the fate of Middle-earth as witnessed by Sam in this passage is a vivid demonstration of Sauron's lack of foresight. His sudden realisation of his impending doom, precipitated by his underestimation of Frodo's resolve, emphasises his failure to consider the possibility of his enemy's resilience and willingness to sacrifice. This oversight, born out of arrogance and contempt for the lesser races of Middle-earth, directly leads to his downfall, highlighting the inherent weakness of his overconfidence and lack of empathy. The lights passed on, away towards the north. Something's drawn its gaze. In understanding Sauron's weaknesses, it is important to recognise them as not just individual flaws, but also reflect broader themes pervasive throughout Tolkien's Legendarium. Sauron's over-reliance on the One Ring and his arrogance are not just personal failings but are emblematic of a corrupting influence of power, a central motive in Tolkien's narrative. This power does not simply corrupt those who wield it, like Sauron, but also those who are exposed to it, as seen in the gradual degradation of the Nazgul and the near fall of Frodo. Furthermore, Sauron's inability to understand the resilience and courage of the free peoples of Middle-earth highlights another key theme, the limitations of evil. Evil, in Tolkien's world, is often short-sighted, unable to grasp the strength found in hope, unity, and unexpected acts of bravery. These themes are critical in understanding not just Sauron's downfall, but the overarching message of the battle between good and evil, between light and darkness in Tolkien's works. <laughs> It is a tragedy to lose one's life, regardless of the manner in which it happens, but it is an even greater existential horror and tragedy to be so enslaved that your identity has been usurped and your person emptied of whatever identity and autonomy it once had, only to be reused and repurposed at the will of another. The slavery to which the Nazgul was subjected to was to be an eternal slavery of the soul, which is implied to be a far worse fate than death. It is soul murder. It is important to remember that when fighting monsters, we risk making monsters of ourselves. 
The continued horror Sauron inflicted on those whom he relied upon is a weakness disguised as a strength, and the wraith's black cloak disguises the nothing that gives it shape, for all within them is emptied. The arrogance of the Dark Lord gave him the idea it was his right to order the world of Arda as he saw fit, as he believed that the freedom to choose was too great a responsibility to leave in the hands of such weak beings, such as the like of the elves, the dwarves, or the men. They were unworthy, undeserving of their freedom, and in the mind of Sauron, his efforts were not for their enjoyment, but the improvement of the free peoples of Middle Earth and did all in his power to keep the realms of men and any who would oppose him divided and at war with each other until such a time he was able to regain his former strength. In the end, he was not strong enough to survive his own hubris, the failure of the ring, the dependency on slave labour, and the division he was to unleash on the world did more to rally its inhabitants against him than cow them, once again underestimating the ability of the children of Iluvatar, their will to live and live freely, and what danger they present should they come together and act in concert for a purpose, a purpose that was greater than themselves, one which allowed them to throw down the Dark Lord once and for all. Thus ending the tyranny that had beset the second and third ages of the world, haunting the memory of many of those free peoples. So there we have it, a look into Sauron's weaknesses. His over-reliance on the One Ring, his arrogance, and his failure to understand the resilience of his adversaries reveal not just the flaws of a powerful being, but also the larger themes of power, corruption, and the triumph of the human spirit against overwhelming odds. Sauron's story serves as a reminder of the complexities of evil and the unforeseen consequences of an unbridled thirst for power. In the end, his weaknesses rendered him vulnerable to the very forces he sought to dominate, leading to his inevitable downfall and the liberation of Middle-earth. This all shows not only the depth in all of Tolkien's world, but also offers timeless insights into the nature of power and morality. And really, overall, at the end of all this, it really just shows what Sauron's weaknesses truly were. And with that is now time for my question of the day, which is, what do you think was Sauron's single greatest weakness? Of everything I've talked about today, or maybe something else entirely? Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section down below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys are continuing to support our short film, The Guard. We are making good progress, and I cannot thank you all enough. We of course have the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheath, and the Wizard Staff tier members of Andrew and Hunter. So finally, if you've managed to reach the end of this video today, and you really enjoyed what you've seen, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button, and getting that bell icon with all notifications ticked, so that you you well know when all future uploads go up. And so, thank you for spending just some of your time with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword. For Frodo.